Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. As always, it's good to be here with you again at OC Talk Radio. And today, Paul, is a you and me show. You and me. I'm you ready. and me, yep. And I plan for us to talk about one of your favorite subjects, change. <laughs> Now, I know you hate change, so you're, change. you're going to be the perfect partner for this important show. But before we begin our subject, I want to give you a public congratulations on your new grandchild. Well, thank you. There was a change that uh, came in my life here. Just It was just like a week ago, a week and a half ago? Yes. Actually, my second grandson was born. Uh, uh, little Aiden, little good Irishman that he is. Got an Irish Got name. Got an Irish name. My daughter's Hispanic, but she gave him an Irish name here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I was going to ask how many grandchildren you have. So this is your, how old is your your first grandson? First grandson just turned six the same week. So now we only have to have one birthday every year for both of them. Oh, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't, I don't that's horrible like that, but... <laughs> for the kids. <laughs> really? Great for you, but horrible for the kids. Really? Well, that's uh, that's great news, Paul. Congratulations. You know, and, and given today's topic, it, it is kind of timely that you bring it up because that was a change. I had no... I wasn't prepared for to be a grandfather at this age. Um, I never knew my grandparents, so I had no role model to follow. I didn't know what it was like to be a grandparent. And it, at first it was very confusing, but it's been ex the most exhilarating thing I've ever gone through in my life. It's the coolest job in the world. You fill them up with sugar and you send them home. It's all the fun and none of the worry. That's what I hear. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, my son was just married last yeah, November, so be. I'm going to find out within a... I'm Shoot, sure you a will. A few short years yeah. of what that's all about. I can't say. I know everybody says it's the greatest. Being a grandparent is the greatest. And I look at it and say, I, I don't want to clean diapers again. <laughs> well, there is that too to it. But they do. It's, it is a different feeling. You, you look at the little guy when he comes over and you start to say, don't do that. Don't pick your nose. And then you're like, ah, the heck with it. Pick your nose. Go ahead. Here, have some more sugar. You know, <laughs> have some more sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It's it's all the fun, and with with little or less of the responsibility and worry that you had when you were a parent. Well, congratulations. That's Thank great you. news. Thank you. Okay, over the weekend, as I was reading, I came across a quote by playwright George Bernard Shaw, who wrote this. Another Irishman. Is he? Oh, yeah. I see. I, you Irish people, we you think everything together. is Irish. <laughs> Everybody everything, is Irish. And everything that is Irish, you think is the best in the world. And, you know, it, it's it's a country that's about the size of <laughs> oh, Peanut. Pico Rivera. <laughs> yeah, all right. You exactly. <laughs> I, I, can I just give you a quick one on this? So Joe Biden, who's very Irish, uh, was at uh, his uh, rally the other day, and he quoted some English poet. I, I hadn't heard of President Anybody quoted poetry in a long time. So he said this poem, and it was in English. And then he said, and let me tell you, though, a real poem and by an Irishman. And I just thought this is that just using that term. Yeah, there's poets, and then there's real poets, the Irishman. So that's the way we view you it. You Irish. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Everybody's a little Irish. Yeah, I uh, no. <laughs> 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 so anyway, let's go by this uh, Yeah. Po this this quote by this Irish poet, George Bernard Shaw, who wrote this: "Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything." Mm. Now, I uh, I had a difficult time with the transition between those. It was it was not really an expected transition. So let's let's dissect this quote a bit. First of all, Shaw said. Progress is not possible without change. Okay, that's that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Assuming you're an advocate of progress, then you cannot have progress without changing something. That's just that's a flat given. That's you know, there's no need to debate or discuss that 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 change is necessary for progress or else it's a status quo. But now then notice where Shaw goes with the next piece of the quote. And I find it quite unexpected. He says, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. I, I, I found it interesting that he talks about changing your mind as a primary element 
in progress and change. And I really like that idea because I believe that change begins with an internal acceptance of doing or believing something different. But that it is, change begins internally. It does not begin externally. It begins with a belief system. And I want to talk a lot more about changing your mind in just a bit. But before I do, I, I would like to, de- to be clear that our subject for today is what I'm calling deliberate change. Now, change comes in many forms, such as drastic, intermittent, spontaneous, and then there is thoughtful or deliberate change, both of which imply some form of intentionality. The first three types of change, drastic, intermittent, spontaneous, most often incur in spite of us and not because of us. And most of the times these kinds of changes are forced on us by circumstances that some authority or another person uh, is putting on us. In other words, it is a change that we ourselves did not initiate. And we're looking at one today that you brought up, and that's the coronavirus. Yeah, it's been imposed upon us. Nobody wanted it, was prepared for it, knows what to do with it. And and it's I'm not knocking the change. I'm not saying the change is wrong. Mm-hmm. I have no. I, I'm I'm saying I have no idea. I have I haven't enough evidence to make any kind of decisions on it. But change is imposed. But such also, as as I was thinking before the coronavirus has really becoming daily and increasing issue, um, such as a political climate today, isn't it? One party wants us to change back Mm -hmm. to the good old days, Mm -hmm. whatever the hell those were. Mm -hmm. And the other side desires a change forward, not necessarily better, but forward, moving forward, moving different, a change of, uh, implying a change to do something different from the way we've been doing politics. Mm -hmm. Either way, the change is something we personally have little to do with apart from voting. Uh, other than voting, you know, we just we get the brunt of the of the change, and and uh, I stray, and I want to be careful uh, that you don't take the entire show ranting on politics. <laughs> ah, the opening he's been looking for, <laughs> yeah, I know. which is I which I guess ranting is one way of dealing with change. It's um, not very productive. But it is a load productive. of fun. It is a load of fun. It is a load of fun. But back to our. Uh, Our topic, deliberate change, deliberate or thoughtful or intentional change, requires at the start. Now, this is this is I think really important that this kind of change requires a conscious choice to change one's mind. Let's just stop on that for a second because I I still trying to digest that. So you're saying I can't change. There's something within me that has to change first there is some barrier to change built into us. Unless we change our, our existing mindset, fights change. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, unless you're pathologically inclined to change like myself. Like you are, yeah. You, yeah, you but, seem to embrace change, look change, seek change. Um, but, but yes, yes, safe because of our, you know, if you look at our, our Maslowian chart, Mm-hmm. Of, of moving toward enlightenment, the very first level is safety and security, and that y- y- you that you implies no change, right? There. Yeah, you make change and you impact uh, safety and security, and and we have to be ready for that. Um, but but this changing one's mind. It, l- let me go on with this just a bit because I, I really found something interesting on it that changing one's mind also means repenting which is which is odd in the bible did you know that the actual definition of the word repent in the bible literally means to change one's mind no it does never. not mean to change your behavior or to ask for forgiveness or to to get to pay penance or or what do they call those things where they paid money for indulgences? indulgences. Right. You know that that's not what repent is. Repent. <laughs> don't, don't don't bring us Catholics back into it again. <laughs> indulgences. <laughs> so when John the Baptist went around preaching, repent for the kingdom of God and God is at hand. He was actually telling the people, change your ways of thinking. 
because life itself is about to be changed significantly in the near future. And yet you think of repenting as changing your ways of acting. I'm not going to be mean anymore. I'm not going to be negative. I'm not going to do so. I'm not going to do that anymore. But you're saying it starts, it's not just a behavioral change. It's an, it's a mind change. It's a mind change. It's an internal mindset change. It's where your, your whole psyche, your, your conscious and unconscious. Maybe that's why change is so difficult because I can change my behavior. I can get myself to get up 10 minutes earlier. I may not like it, but I can force myself to do or go out and exercise or do something. But to change my belief, to change my thinking on something, to say, I used to think that was wrong and maybe it's not, that's hard. Why? <laughs> Good question. I'm trying to think through it myself, but it Look how set, and the older we get, don't we get more set in those ways? Not uh, all of us. No, you're weird. You do. You're uh, you're, uh, you're from another planet here or something. <laughs> but I, I find more people getting more set in their ways. I certainly have as I've gotten older. It's harder for me to get out of my mindset. Uh, and I think that's what's led to this hardening of political views. As our country has gotten older, we're not a younger country. We're an older country. Like many Western countries, our birth rate's dropping, so that population's aging. We're living longer than we ever have. Maybe that's Except why. in third world countries where the population is exploding. Yeah, exactly. And, and young people are exploding. You, you know, some of these countries are half young people or third young people. 600,000 people on, at, 15, at 15 and older are entering the workforce annually in Uganda. Wow. See, yeah. 600,000 people are entering the workforce. And you think of what's the declining birth rate in Europe and Japan, here in the United States, uh, and and how the popul- aging baby boomers are going to are living longer. So there's a large fewer babies being born, older people living longer. That's got to upend that. Yeah, well, you know that I, I think I, I think never the, thought old, about the it, older though. the older people and the, the reluctance to change goes back to the two words that we used earlier, and that is safety and security. Maybe. They, you know, they, they have their income, which just became terribly unsafe in the market. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm feeling really fortunate that we're not going to have to tap into ours for probably close to another decade. So Good. there will be time to recover from, from this, this loss. But... There are those that are depending on that that income. Oh, that yeah, they need it today or tomorrow. So, uh, I, but you you're onto something here, and I don't know. I've never really thought about it. But what is it about us as we get older? That's a, that's a, one of those accepted truisms. I don't know if it's really true, but we accept that the older you get, hard to hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Hard to change the older you get. You get set in your ways. We've all heard these statements, and I think there's truth in it. Um, why do we do we calcify, solidify? Why do we get set in our ways? You know, I think that's you know one thing I, that you have to say about that is that's anecdotal, and I would love Clearly, to see yeah. I would love to see data on that to see you know what re- what really is the the change True. equation of people as they as they grow older, fifty, sixty, seventy. Um, because I'm I'm with a lot of people that that do like change and do like to do things differently. Yet I do know a host that do not that believe what they're going to believe, and you just you can no matter what kind of evidence you give them, evidence means them. nothing. Evidence yeah. means nothing. But but those are not the people I'm talking about today. No. Uh, I'm talking about people who understand the need for change, and that change happens either to them. Or actually for them, that they are, and I want to talk about the change that we initiate ourselves, and that that um, requires an internal determination that dictates our actions and beliefs. Okay. We, we decide based on a number of factors that our reasoning may be faulty. And that we may need to reconsider and and look at the number of things that have that have totally been reconsidered 
since 1970 to 2020. I mean, we have women's issues. Yeah. We have we have gender issues. We have race issues. Gay rights is the most dramatic change I've ever seen the country go through. The the well, and it, women. Women has not been small. No, but I'm just saying in a rapid period of time. We went for oh, oh, President Obama started off as saying, "I don't, I'm not sure I believe in that marriage isn't just for a man and a woman." Halfway through his term, he changed. That rapid acceptance of gay rights and gay marriage shows my knowledge of politics. He changed from what to what. He started uh, like nearly every politician saying that marriage should just be for a man and a woman. That that he could not wrap his head around gay marriage. He could not. He did not support it. Um, and by the end of his term, he had uh, willingly admitted he changed. Good. That's not something most politicians do that quickly. And you know, whether he did it willingly or under pressure or saw the handwriting on the wall, what I don't know, you know, good, bad, or whatever, what went on in his mind. But I think that it, you think of how long it took for civil rights or women's emancipation, which is still in many ways still going on. I thought we'd fought this battle, and here we are in the Me Too movement all over again. Uh, I well, thought that's fading. Yep, I'm just saying, with these issues that I thought had been fought for and addressed a long time ago, companies had sexual harassment policies and stuff in place. Suddenly, but they weren't following them, or they weren't adhering to well, them. Well, they good. weren't believing them yet. Yeah. And and after a couple of lawsuits, you start believing. Yeah. So so here's my point to change. You Does change come, change in your mind, in yourself, Does the, what is the epiphany? What is the triggering event? Is it something outside you, a disaster, a lawsuit, uh, a problem, something that makes you re-look at your life? That's, I think of times I've had to relook at my life, usually when something went really bad. Or is it a proactive, I'm happy where I'm at and I want to be happier? You know, I think, I think uh, honestly, you gave really good examples, and I would have to, I have to say I'm sorry, yes to all of them. <laughs> because it is, it is, in my experience, it is really one of two things. It's data or experience. Yes. You know, the data becomes clear that what I once believed, I, you know, I no longer can believe, or my experience. And that was the reason I, I'm not so as much into international travel, especially today, but not, not as much into international travel since I've taken on the, the, the charity work and I'm in Africa two to three to four times a year. Yeah, that's filled um, a void or filled a but, role. But... That experiential change has really changed my worldview drastically. My my view of, of how the world operates. When when I spend so much time in a developing country, I begin to understand what makes people tick in that country. And believe me, I have scratched the surface. I do not pretend I believe it. to be an expert in that. But what we would consider corruption is not corruption there. No, that's you, just normal day that business. That is the yeah. way you do business. If, if you know, taking a bribe, you or grease taking a my kickback, hand, I grease yours. Yeah, yep, yeah. and hiring friends. This is just. This is this is not an ethical issue. It is. It, it would be looked on laughingly as an ethical issue, because it is simply the way business is done. That's that's how, you, you know, your your brother gets a job and you're thinking, thank goodness, you know, I have a chance of getting a job at the same yeah, place right. because my brother has a job. And that that begins to impact my worldview yes. and my worldview of the way life exists and my way, worldview of ethics and that they are socially determined. They are not determined by some... You don't just sit on a mountaintop and come to the conclusion here. Hmm, let me contemplate life. Uh, that's the way it should be. But we do in the West. Well, we you, you, we're always on a quest. You're you're part of that generation. You you uh, you're the you're the poster child for it. You're always looking to improve yourself. You're always on a self quest to uh, go deeper into your psyche and experience something. You're always putting yourself. So that that's that's your generation. Well, Always that's, looking for self awareness. That's me of our generation. We, I was just talking to somebody um, about the hippies, and right. and and they were of the hippie days, and they mm -hmm. said, 
We really didn't do shit. <laughs> it's a little you know, romanticized, you know, maybe. It, it was. It was really. Uh, I just read an article about it. And it was really about a four or five year deal. You know, it was really about that, 1967 yeah. to 1970, 71. Yeah. You know, it started in 64, but but. It's the last couple of years. The summer of love was 69. That was a yeah, part of the yeah, and that was when I started. I started in in 67 at UCLA and and then uh you know left my full scholarship for gymnastics to be a full-time hippie yeah right um, i mean you literally hitchhiked across the country didn't you i did 3 months on $200 and so, a backpack and a guitar so what led uh, here's my question to you what led look back on that charlie what led to that kind of dramatic conscious deliberative change simple curiosity that just that it was curiosity and experience let me i've never experienced anything like this curiosity experience the opportunity for genuine freedom no one saying to do anything we picked up you know we we would spend a night at a place and if we liked it we would stay if we didn't we would Go out and put our thumbs out and hitchhike to another place. But it wasn't safe and secure. Oh, it you, was. You, you, but you're safe and secure at UCLA, a prestigious school. You've got a full scholarship there. Can't get much easier. Uh, money's not a worry. No, no, you're not going to go into the draft, and nothing's going to happen here. And yet you chose to do something very uncertain, go out into the great unknown for excitement. Because I got bored at school. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just got bored with school, but we're going to move on. All right. We're, we're going to well, those, those, those are great questions. The only those point I make questions. is the time in my life that I experienced the greatest change was similarly when I went to college. I went from being a sheltered suburban kid to University of Michigan, wide open, and I did. I changed my views on many, many things, uh, life in general, just because of that experience. I, I wasn't expecting to change. I didn't go there to change. But it was so. It was life changing. All right. So let's let's. You know what I want to do today is something that is that's a part of me. Systems are a part of me, and yet I don't want to present a system for change. Okay. What I'm going to do is it, it's going to come out like a system. So there's going to be five points. But you want to take a break first, and then you're prepping us for this. Let me prep us, and then then, then we'll get into there. Right. Just a couple minutes for a break. Um, what I want to do is is for the remainder of our time to discuss some elements or stages of deliberate change and change in your mind. But please, I ask the audience to keep in mind that although I present these as stages in a process. Any one of them can be applied at any part of your process. So I would prefer that you look at Paul and my chat as ideas, not necessarily a system. They may come out as a system. But um, I, also, I also want to say this, and I, I may remind us after the break, but no, let's take the break and then I'll do this because it, okay. it, it's better to take the yeah, break. Yeah, you're now. launching into something big. I got to get ready here. I got to go to the bathroom and get get set here. <laughs> Charlie Hedges at the next chapter with Charlie, and I am talking to producer Paul about deliberate change. And we have covered the difficulty of old people changing their mind, which which is Paul, <laughs> and young people which change their mind easily, which is me, although I'm older than Paul. <laughs> so <laughs> only physically. <laughs> Well, mentally, I, I, I got you beat here, right? I'm an old soul here. No, you're, a, you're a young hippie at heart. I, I, I think I, I think I am. Now, I, as I, as I said just before the break, that I would like our listeners to look at this as ideas, not necessarily a system, although they're presented as stages 
It doesn't, you can break the stage and do things out of order. It doesn't make a difference. These are just ideas, but, but they are, they, they tell well as stages. Now, to help us in the process, I'm actually going to do what producer Paul has been wanting me to do for forever, and I'm going to use a story oh, finally. as an example. We're turning finally. into an Irishman here, all right. We are not turning <laughs> Irish into an love Irish. stories. We have not turning into an Irishman. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get me to have a a pint and sing a song. <laughs> that's the start. That's the that's the first step. Take a pint and start and sing a song. And that's sing a, a song. You got to sing a song, whether you can sing or not. <laughs> Um, but to help us in the process, I want to use this example that goes way back to 1990. And that was when, as a successful minister in a mega church, I made a decision that within one year I would be doing an entirely new job. Wow. That I would no longer, and it would not be a church related job. I, 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 and I had no idea what that job was. I had experience in business in the 70s where I managed for a decade I you know I managed around a hundred people in a wet processing division of a carpet mill but then I went to seminary and my and my education was in theology and my history was in theology I didn't know you know how that was going to impact how, how I was going to get into the business world if my resume would allow yeah. that no, I, I got to stop you because the whole world is screaming to know why did you make that decision? Do you remember when you made it and why did you make it? Why change? You'd gone to school, you'd become successful. Why change? I'm silent because I'm I'm debating on how much of the truth I tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we want all the truth. We want to hear uh, it all. I, I just was not hardwired to be a. Um, a minister of a church. I discovered, I you know, I went to seminary for three years, got my degrees. That's a and, lot of effort, right? And yeah, 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 and and I entered the ministry to preach, teach, counsel, baptize, marry, bury, <laughs> and I found out that was about fifteen percent of my job. Oh yeah, okay. The rest of my job was administrative because oh. I had so many. It was a mega church. I had so many people that I was responsible for. I was responsible for training and leadership development, uh, small groups. I had over two hundred sixty leaders that reported to me. Wow. And I was in charge of single adults ministry that had over a thousand people. Three to four hundred people would show up every Sunday to listen to me ramble on and um that was that you know the, the preaching was fine but then it was just when you're doing that you're managing you know a single group so i was managing freaking dances you know that we got to do dances <laughs> of and course like, yeah like you know i what do i what do i care social about? director yeah. what do i care about being yeah that was it i felt like a cruise director <laughs> you know and and it was just not me. And then there were just things about the church that were not me that... that but was there a, an epiphany, a breaking point when you said, this is it, I can remember the night I came home and threw it down the thing and said, or was it just a gradual, uh, at some point I just knew? You know, it was like a breaking point, but I can't tell you what the breaking point was. I can't tell you any... any um, event or circumstances that led to it. But it was really quick. It was within a week where I just said, I had I had gradually been coming to it, Paul. Where yeah. th I was growing weary of being an administrator. And I said, if I'm going to be an administrator, I'm going to get paid for it. You don't get yeah. paid for it at a church. Right. The kind of work that I was doing, I could get paid for in the corporate world. And um, it turned out that the job I ended up with paid in three days what I made a month oh. in, <laughs> in in the church. So, I mean, I, I, I fell into a, a lucrative a lucrative thing, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I just decided it was time to change. I no longer fit in, in the church way of thinking. Uh, there was, a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things. I, I'm, my theology was changing there was there was a lot of factors, but it became just really obvious with all those factors. Okay. I needed to make a change. So 
let's go let's start with what are the stages or steps of um change of making a deliberate change intentional change this is something that you have decided to do this is not something that this forced is forced upon you i get yeah, fired is, or something this here, is yeah. like getting fired divorce right coronavirus yeah right all of that and it begins with an acknowledgement of a faulty belief system i think i think the starting point is acknowledging that perhaps your presuppositions or beliefs may be faulty alan jones once made a great quote in in a book that he wrote a journey book and and he wrote most of us have secondhand beliefs Hmm. and i have never forgotten that quote i read it 30 years ago and the quote is so true because most of us believe what we're told to believe. Mm-hmm. And especially in churches, we believe whatever the pastor tells us to believe mm-hmm. without really researching and pondering what do I believe in, in, in my, my core self. And so that leaves lots of room for faulty thinking because I have not really analyzed it, not determined it, not, not made this, the decision based on data and evidence that I, I have thought through, I have just allowed those decisions. And um, we discover our faulty presuppositions based on new data that we get new information, like you talked about Obama mm-hmm. and, and gay marriage. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that he got new data mm-hmm. that and new experiences, and it said... I'm going to change my mind. No, perhaps it was a totally political decision. I don't know. I'm not going to go there. I don't either. But but I but I would take it. But it was traumatic as a human. and it was public and it took place in a short period of time. But he got new data. Mm-hmm. You know, he talked to some people, new experience, and came out and said, you know, my beliefs were wrong. Which you know, I'd really admire the guy for doing that. You know, I I, I love. <laughs> I love telling people, you know, don't believe what I say today because I can change my <laughs> yeah, mind tomorrow. Right. You know, if someone were to give me new data. Um, so let me give you some new data here. Let me just challenge you on that. So you've talked about, I think you said once a long time ago, if you'd been born in another country, would you still be a Christian? Nope. Yeah, you might be a Muslim or a No, Buddhist if I was or, born in Iraq, I wouldn't might be a Muslim. I'd either, I would be a Muslim. Yeah, and and that would be your worldview, and that's what you're raised to believe, and you yep. would. I think that's true of most of us. I don't think most of us, we either abandon our views and become sort of a mishmash of nothing, which is happening more and more. But I don't see very often that people say, I was a, a devout Catholic and now I'm a devout Buddhist. I don't think that happens too often. I don't think we get to that point where we suddenly sit down and say, all right, let me take a rational look at both worldviews here. Uh, and, and and yet I think that is, I think that's absolutely essential and that's what I've that's what I have done in the last especially decade if I have I have researched other religions especially um, Franciscan Christianity mm-hmm. and and uh, Taoism in mm, China in, in China and Eastern thought and it has it has significantly impacted my views on Christianity it has not taken me away from Christianity; it's just added to it. Mm-hmm. It's added new information, added, added, a, added a, a fulfillment to it that I had one narrow way of looking at it. And now I have a much broader stance, a much, a much more open world view, and that came that came through. Again, data and experience. Data doing the reading, mm-hmm. and then experiencing these things, and that came to you know all of my, all of my. I have I have gone from a conservative, um, in what do you call them in the, in the human justice systems of, of, gender issues, racial issues. Um, um, sexual orientation issues, um, health issues. Those of I've gone from a very conservative point of view to not a liberal point of view, but, but perhaps a very a progressive in a some very sense. progressive, right. centrist, little left, mm-hmm. centrist, just little left. You've moved, right? 
Yeah, but that was because of information, and I've changed my mind on that. And and so what I had to do was, first of all, acknowledge that my belief system was faulty. Well, even before you acknowledge it, you have to recognize it. You have to say, hmm, you have to question it. And then you have to, once you question it and investigate it, then it either holds up or it doesn't. I always said to my daughter, and I don't think most people go through this. I, I know she didn't, and I always thought people should. There comes a point in your life, usually when you're a teenager, where you have to start to really decide, what are my core beliefs? In other words, what is non, I won't compromise on. Will I take drugs or not? Will I have sex or not? Do Will I cheat or lie or not here? What? At some point, it's not what you've been taught or told to do, but it's what you know, right or wrong, good or bad, this is this is me. This is my core, and then, and then at some point when you get new data, like let's just go back to to uh, gay, President Obama. Gay marriage or something. You know, right. he, he received new data that that he had an intact belief system. Yeah, a strong but, belief But he system. received new information, received new insight, and acknowledged he had a faulty belief system. Mm-hmm. So you have, to, you have to say that, you know, when we have secondhand beliefs, we have automatically, we have faulty belief systems. Those are just, yeah, those are just by us, nature right? because right. They, are not, they are not held within ourselves. So then that moves us to the next step. So once you acknowledge, okay, I've got a faulty belief system. I don't know, you know exactly what I'm going to do with it. I think it goes to the next step, and that is you admit a desire to change. Yes, right. Now, you don't know what that change is going to be, but you admit a a desire to change, and that change will impact your behaviors. And this this admitting a desire to change is proven so strongly in the first of the 12 steps. I was going to say, this sounds a lot like 12 steps. Isn't the first step you admit you have a problem? Yep, and, then and the your sec- life is unmanageable. Right, and the second step is what? I never remember the second step in the 12-step program. Oh, man, don't be asking me the steps. I'm supposed to know the steps. You're supposed yes, to uh, spit them off it, like... It, uh, it, it, it is it, to know that uh, I cannot make a change, but there is a power greater than myself. Yes, I need help. That, that can do it. I need... Yeah, I like that. I need help. I need help. But uh, so I got a problem, and I need help. But but this is this is surely admitting that I desire to change is surely a most vital step in this whole process. If I if I if I acknowledge that I have a, I have a faulty belief system, but I don't have a desire to change, then I'm I'm just admitting that I'm living on living on on a house built on sand yeah not on rock and so uh uh, can i throw another one in there though yeah do you believe you can change because i really i'll bet that's not on your list but i don't think most people think they can change if they had a job were you married at the time that you had made this change yes so you got a house you got a wife maybe you got a kid some of us start to feel like i can't change even if i want to i met a guy years and years ago i'll tell you my story at a party and he said, you're that guy that does all these things and lives in California, which is back east. I said, yeah. He said, I wish I could be like you. I wish I could change. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, I work for a railroad. My dad worked for a railroad. My grandfather works for a railroad. I hate working for a railroad. I'm like, well, change. I can't. I got a house. I got kids. I got payments. I got everything. I got a life invested in this. I can't change. He was convinced. He hated his life, but he was convinced he couldn't change. And I thought, how sad. Yeah, he had a faulty belief system. Mm-hmm. But could not acknowledge the faulty belief mm, I system. I see. Okay, right. Could not go to say, my belief system is errant. The belief that I can't change, right, because he just yeah. felt trapped. I think a lot of people feel trapped. Yes, yes. And and that is an errant belief system. I think it needs to be done. Let's, let's go through all of them and see if they're helpful through okay. the rest of the stage to see if they're helpful. Um, but But they sort of deal with that. But that is a great point that in the time of child rearing, you know, your 30s, your early 40s, your late 20s, those are very, 
those are times that are are critical not only to yourself but they're impacting your loved ones as well easy to change when i went to college I just i didn't affect anybody but me harder to change you get married kids houses cars careers all yeah that. i had i had i had marriage and houses i did not have children when i made the change okay i didn't i didn't have children until i was an old man i was I was 42 when my son was what? born. What? Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm coaching baseball at 50 <laughs> when the rest of these guys are 20-something. But I was I was beating their ass like crazy. I want to go back <laughs> and see that scene. All right, go ahead. Yeah. So so we begin with admitting a faulty, a faulty belief system. Two, admit a desire to change. And three is is really quite o- obvious. It's, it's, okay, I need to change. Three is just consider your options. Weigh the evidence. Although you have um, already admitted to yourself that your beliefs may be faulty or that you, you may or may not have arrived at a replacement conclusion, that I'm thinking, like, what you know, I wanted to go to my life story, but I'm going to Brock's, mm-hmm. and he, he could easily say, my gay marriage thing is wrong is not I, I no longer believe in that you know wrong or right is right. the wrong word um i no longer believe in that but i don't know what i do believe yes oh, I, I i do know i don't believe this but i don't know what i you what just I do defined believe. it defined defined it <laughs> defined it you just found it and defined it that's a new word defined it <laughs> you you came up with a way to explain in my mind why I will say the majority of Americans, the majority of Americans do not have any sort of clear religious belief anymore. For the first time ever, Pew polls the last couple of years have shown when they ask people, what's your religious preference? They say none of the above. No identification, no real clear feeling because they know what they don't like anymore. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not an evangelical. I'm not that anymore. But they don't know what they become. They're, They're very... They're very unclear of what comes next. They, and, they, and that is where that is where I think we have to make a a if this if this value, if this belief system you have is important enough, then I think I think it 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 urges you to make an evaluation of what are your options. What are the options that are out there? Rather than just sit with non-recorded and non-belief, you knew religion was once, you know, using your example, you knew religion was once important to you. Right. But but it no longer is important. But What now? But, but what now? And I think, I think we're talking about essential elements of life i think you know belief in a deity or not is you know and, and i'm at this point not advocating either although you know you know my i, I have a strong belief system right as do i right but but i i respect those that don't and i and if you choose to don't make it a choice yes. make it a conscious choice and so you know this requires deep thought Conversation with your closest friends, and counsels with and counsel with experts in the field, and reading. If, if if it's you know if we're going to be talking about religion, look a little bit at it and see what sort of what sort of spirituality do you want to embrace? Because I like the way Terry, in our last episode, defined spirituality as it's mm-hmm. not flesh and blood. There's something much more to me than flesh and blood. Mm-hmm. And I believe with every human being, there's something much more than flesh and blood. And to help sort of articulate that, even if even if half of it is, I don't know, I you know, then... then um, as long as you're on the journey to finding it, I think many people say, I don't know and quit. I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to believe. And they just stop. And that becomes paralyzing. It doesn't. They don't embrace. They don't say. Well, let me go on a logical search. Let me break it down. Let me draw a T on a piece of paper and put the pluses and minuses and let me explore all the options. They just get frozen by that 
I don't know if it's fear or whatever, but they just, I, I can't move forward. I can't go back. Then, then let's go back to step, to step two, which is, do they desire to change? You're talking about people that don't desire to change. Maybe they're caught if you don't desire to change, then it's, it's not going to happen. I have been, here's a weird analogy I'll tie in. I've had moments and periods in my life where I went through lots of depression. I don't seem like a depressive personality, but inside me, yes, I. my mother was that way, so I've inherited some of that. I could get very depressed a couple times in my life. And I went to a therapist, and they said, you know, really the basis of dis- depression, in their opinion, was inability to make a decision. Go for it or don't go for it. Go back or go forward. You get stuck in that it's like just make some choice and move in some direction here. I think people get stuck in that indecisive phase, and all it does is bring you down. Well, I'm going to come back to Paul. I'm going to come back to the desire to change. Do you want to change? Mm-hmm. Do you do you do you want this in your life? And and it, it could be a belief system. It could be a job. It could you know a for new marriage, out loud, whatever. It could be. I, it could yeah, be a, yeah. I was going to say it could be a marriage, and and it could be in the social issues. You right. know, do, you, you, where you, you live, know, you know, make you make it make a decision. Consider consider those options. Now, my option in my church job mm-hmm. was a phone call. I got I had no idea what I was going to do. I had I I knew in June of 1990. I said in one year I will not be here. Hmm. I just I just said that told that to my wife and to a couple of friends and said I have no idea what I'm going to be doing, but I will not be here. And sometime January, February, we received a phone call. My wife, Tobo, was asked, uh, the Chevron Corporation is looking for external trainers. <laughs> Chevron is going to hire an ex-minister to be a trainer. Well, oh, they asked my wife, who was, who was you know, in business, and, and that was her business resume, and she said, no, I can't do it, but Charlie could be interested. And the person who was making the phone call used to be in my ministry and loved my ministry and there said, you are go. you kidding we could get Charlie to do this yeah. because you know he can because it was an external consultant to do training. Right. So they'd and, seen you in front of a group of people and training people religiously. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So so then, then many people who have more new age beliefs than you and I do would say you simply put it out to the universe. I did. I wouldn't. I I would I would say that. With my religious, religious <laughs> really? beliefs, really okay. I put it out to the universe, and y- you know, I I happen to believe that God has something to do with the universe. <laughs> okay. So, so, but I I just threw it out there, and I think that's in. I think that's you know. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really, 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 really critical step. Yeah. Is throwing something out there, putting in a statement, putting it in writing. Yes. And 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 getting it down, saying I want to, I will, and then you don't even have to go back and review it. There was something about putting it in there and throwing it out to the universe mm-hmm. that that sticks, and it works. And I and I got a call from the universe, and and I decided you were to, open uh, to it at that moment to mm-hmm. say, you know, this this looks like a grand opportunity. So I need to I need to check it out. I think that is a big part. I've heard many men. I can give you lots of stories where people have said, I made a commitment, and I just didn't tell myself. I told somebody. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes. I, I, I made some sort of declaration, this is real, and challenged myself to hold myself accountable and somebody to hold me accountable or whatever. I remember reading Jim Carrey once, the comedian, famous comedian, when he was struggling and homeless. He wrote down, an, he filled out a check, and he, he made a check to himself for $10 million, and they didn't have 10 cents. But he wrote it out, and he just kept it in his pocket. Someday I'm going to be able to cash this check. And of course, you know the story. Yes, he did. He made he did, millions. Except of... he couldn't today. But he did. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I don't know what it happened along the way. But you know that I hear those kind of anecdotal stories. Steve Harvey talks a lot about that. Of how you just got at some point in your life, you got to declare something. I'm going to be different. You got to write it, physically write it, physically tell somebody. That is that is, I think I think perhaps as we're talking about it, I think that could be one of the strongest steps. I really do in making the change. I do is is throwing it out there. Mm-hmm. Believe me, it, it sounds crazy. It sounds new agey. I don't care how it sounds. I just know it works. Right. That when you when you throw it out there. I, I, I did one thing one time where I said, what am I going to do in my life? And I said, in the next five years, I'm going to visit 
10 countries. Yeah, right. You said that right. And, and, and I did it within two years. Right. And I had no idea. I, I had no idea how I was going to do that. Mm-hmm. I had no idea, yet Yet it just So it I just think it's happened. something about not just in your own mind making turning that switch, but publicly proclaiming it, writing it down, telling others something about that commits you to it and, it, and, and makes you open to it. It commits you. I mean, where you are, you are now thinking about it, and you are, you are aware of it. Right. So, so the next one we want to go through the next two really yeah, quickly we're because running out we're of time running, here. we're running late. But then the next two won't take a long time. The 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 fourth one is is really in line with the, with the third one of consider your options. It's contemplate. Hmm. It's now that you've done your op, your your options. Uh, Depending on the severity of the change, deep reflection is required. You don't just do it. You, you, you reflect. You look at the options. You know, you've weighed the options. Now it's time. Now it's time to reflect on them. And you do know. you have to remove yourself? Because you and Terry talk about that so often, and I do that so little. I suspect most of us do it so little where I go somewhere. I get away. I go on a retreat. I, I get quiet. I do something where I get out of my normal self and my normal routine to find that, to, to deep dive into myself. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I have so four, rarely do that. Four to, you know, I don't do it as frequently as I should, but I have four to five days a year minimum where I am by myself and and reflecting on life, the universe, and I everything. can't think of four or five days in my last 20 years that I've been alone like that. I've never gone yeah, on a retreat and, and or anything. Y- you, know, y- you know, for me, for a well-lived life, it's essential. Yes. I mean, but that, that is for me. So, it's so maybe essential. That's another... Otherwise, I'm just acting all the time, in a, and I get so involved and so caught up in the yeah. actions. And, I, and then that's how you get caught up in, in, oh, I can't make a change, oh, I can't, because... Because you take no time out from it. Next There's year no, I'll change. Like, next like, week. Like next Terry month. Terry talked about pausing and stepping yes. back. Right. He talks about all the time. You have to pause and step back and, and take a look at these So things. now you've identified two tangible things you can do. One is, you know, after you've decided you want to change and you're going to change a change, publicly declare it. Write it down. Take some action to put yourself out there to throw it out to the universe and tell everybody. And then you're saying, get away. Get quiet. Pause and reflect. Yeah, and I did like now with my with my situation, you know, I really did spend time and I pondered my an hour. I put slash hour because it was definitely impacting my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, options in this matter was it was an entirely different kind of opportunity. Would I be credible as a minister going into talking to high level business people with the Chevron Corporation? Uh, Doesn't seem obvious to me, but maybe it did to them at the time here. If I, if I was the HR director looking for a training, I wouldn't say, let's go get one of those ministers over there. Well, that did actually help because they knew I could public speak and I had yeah. a business resume. But I'll bet of, that when they went into the job, they weren't. that wasn't one of the things they were seeking. I turned out to be their number one trainer. I, by the way, their number one highest paid trainer. Do we have any doubt of that? <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was good at that stuff. Uh, you know, but there's other questions. How long would the gig last? Yeah, you, you, you know, and then I'm out of a job and I'm unemployed. You know, this yeah. is a, this is not a permanent gig. You're a consultant. You're an external consultant. So, con- consultants come and go, and uh, and, and you what had a would wife, I do next? And you had a wife that was willing to go along. And many wives would say, "Over my dead body, you, I'm walking out of here if you do that." What are you crazy? We got a job. We yeah, got. Fortunately, I've had a supportive wife that supported. Nah, all not that everybody's I do. so lucky in that one. Well, she just kind of believes in me. She just figures out. You keep <laughs> oh, go you figure. Keep, you keep you keep <laughs> figuring shit out. So you know, keep it up. Keep trying. All right, let's go on the last one, then we can get out of here. Um, uh, and that is, and that's just the obvious one: is decide on a court of, course of thoughtful action. What is I, your? What I think is, that's the easiest. Once you've gone through all those other steps, making a decision is not as hard as you think it's going to be. If yeah. You've, if you've decided to change, if you're unhappy. You don't like where what you believe. You've made a decision to change. You've thrown it out to the universe. You've taken steps to investigate it. You've you've then you step back and say, "Am I crazy? I'm just really going to do it." And people are supporting you. Then for that final step, which seems so hard, is not that hard. 
Was it hard to accept the job at Chevron after all the agonizing? Not and after that first damn paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. Say, holy cow! What are was you I kidding thinking? me? What is this? <laughs> this is uh, this is money. This is this is crazy. Um, but you know, but it, but it but it comes to I, I didn't want to bring church into this, but it comes into my theological beliefs that are, you know, I I, I went to a very fundamentalist seminary, you know, uh, yeah. I call it the redundant name, you know, Western Conservative Baptist. <laughs> yeah, right, I suppose those liberal Baptists yeah, out there. Yeah, right? and, 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 and I am far from fundamentalist now, and, you know, I, 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 I won't go as far as to speak as I am, but I, but I am, I am quite liberal in my theology, although my core doctrinal theology mm-hmm. is very conservative, mm-hmm. very, you know, the five things i believe you know are just are very conservative and they're, mm-hmm. they're they fit right into the nicene creed and the apostles creed mm-hmm. you know so I, I i go right with those but when it, i i i had a minister friend that once used to call it that we as Chris, christians too often major in the minors and minor in the majors <laughs> oh that's a good way to put it yeah you know and i like to major in the majors yeah the, right. these are these are these are the important things that that make me that make my religious beliefs distinct. Nevertheless, the thing that I have is a total acceptance of all religions. I, I have, you know, I do not say that Christianity is the only religion. That doesn't strike me as today's evangelicalism out there. Oh, well, I am not an evangelical. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm far from an evangelical. That's, that's to be true. Uh, so anyway, let's just wrap this up. And, and I, I really would like to, to encourage people to challenge yourself, find to challenge your belief systems, to challenge to challenge your your core ideals, and see is there a better way out there? And and if you are comfortable and perfectly happy with where you're at, God bless you. That's great. Be there. But if you find that perhaps I may need to alter some of my beliefs. I hope we've given you some ideas to do that. Um, that's been our that's been our goal, and I want to thank uh, Grandfather Paul <laughs> for your willingness to play the uh, change game with me. It's always fun chatting with you. Yes, and I want to thank our listeners for tuning into the next chapter with Charlie, and be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. Bye.